Again, everybody, <laughs> like that is not going to do. Hey, good morning, everybody. Yeah, there we go. I want to make sure you listen. I really preached hard in first service. I'm exhausted, so I'm the one that takes a break. You can all be dismissed. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. So, Selena wanted me to remind you after she did all that work in that announcement that she forgot to mention that you can also register at our registration center for that Bloom Conference on Parenting Skills. As you leave the sanctuary, take a right, and there's a sign-up sheet that you can do that as well. So I have some uh, bad news, sad news, and some good news, good news. The bad news, sad news, is that after 20 years of faithful service, Diana has uh, turned in her resignation. So Diana's going to be leaving us as our church administrator. She's going to pursue other uh, things in her life, and we wish her all the best in the world. Um, and uh, we have hired Rainey uh, Merriman, who's going to be the new church secretary. She'll be coming in for a period of training over the next three weeks. And so that's good news. And the other good news is that Diana's not going anywhere. This is still her church. She's still going to be attending here. And I'm sure she'll find areas of service because that's just who she is. So yeah, 20 years. Congratulations, Diana. We really love and appreciate everything you do. And so at the end of August, don't bother her anymore. She's just one of you. Don't, Diana, I need this. Diana's, where's that? You know, none of that. Leave her alone. She's just a regular. Um, and she'll put you in your place anyway. She knows how to do that pretty good. So, all right. So, uh, yeah, I think what we're going to do is that the last Sunday of August, I think it's the 26th, if memory serves you well, we're going to have like a little thing. We'll have some cake out there. We'll have a basket where you can do some envelopes if you want to give her a, a card of appreciation for all she's done. 20 years, man, it's gone by like that, you know. It's just been, it's been so great. We've never bumped heads in 20 years. <laughs> God's watching. Yeah, it, it's, been, it's, been a great, it's been a great relationship. So um, anyways, 
Sometimes when I go hiking, I see people carve a heart in their initials in the trees, you know. And, and I don't think there's anything romantic about that. As a matter of fact, what surprises me is how many people take knives to dates. Uh, that, that's a little concerning, I guess, right? <laughs> so um, I want to start a series on three keys in the book of Acts. I want us to kind of look at and ask ourselves the question, what's the distinguishing belief or practice that they did that unlocked the power of God in such sensational ways? Um, The book of Acts is the best record of God moving in the early church um, because Christ was with his disciples, now he's working through his disciples, and um, it's a snapshot of about 33 years of span of history of the early church from the time Jesus ascends to the next 33 years and what's accomplished. And so, and we know that our amazing things are accomplished. And the, the amazing thing about it is that God used ordinary men and women. There wasn't any kind of super saint or anything like that. And the book of Acts certainly does not mask over their shortcomings, their faults, their failures, their disputes, or anything like that. It's all right there in living color. But what made the difference? Why? Uh, you know, some people say, well, it was just to start the church, and then after that, it all stopped. But that kind of flies in the face of scriptures that says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, uh, and certainly, his mission and purpose hasn't changed, and his calling on those who come to him hasn't changed. So what are some of the keys? So I'm going to go through them uh, really quick. The first key is that they believed and taught the Word of God. There was this taking in and giving out, taking in and giving out. They believed and taught the Word of God. It became central to them. And when we talk about the Word of God, because we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures where they're preaching the Word of God, we're not talking about the Bible. We're talking about the central theme of the entire scriptures, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what they were preaching, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because there was no comeback to that, because nobody for the last 2,000 years has been able to prove that he didn't rise. There's no body, there's no evidence, all right? And so we're going to see that, listen, if some crazy cult exploded and they said Joe Schmo on the street was resurrected, right? I think somebody somewhere would find a body and produce it and say that's the end of that. They could not produce the body. Why? Because we know in truth that Jesus was resurrected and then he ascended and they believed it and they lived it and they were even martyred for their belief, which was astounding because if it was all a lie, why would all these people be willing to give their life for a lie like that? So they, they believed the word and they taught the word. The other thing is, is that they were filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit. They were always seeking more of the Holy Spirit because they understood that it was the Spirit of God that was energizing everything that was happening in the kingdom of God. And the last one is, is that they knew the authority of the name of Jesus. They didn't have credentials to do what they were doing. As a matter of fact, a lot of times they were threatened, beaten, thrown in jail. But the credential, the authority that they had was simply the name of Jesus. We're doing what we do in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, preach the word, in my name lay hands on the sick, and in my name cast out devils, all this stuff. And so these are the three keys that we see in the book of Acts. They received the word, they taught the word. They were filled with the spirit and looked for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and they knew the authority of the name of Jesus. Of Christ. And so the word kind of convinced people about the, uh, the truth of Jesus. The Spirit confirmed that with signs and wonders following. And then the name was, um, was, was their authority, was, was their credentials on why they did what they did. So this week we just want to look at the word. They believed the word, they taught the word. They believed the word, they taught the word. So I'm going to give a lot of scriptures, just kind of go through some things. If you're taking notes, um, you know, there'll be a lot of scriptures. So the first one is Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It says, when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak the word of God with boldness. So this is the second episode of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The first one takes place in the book of Acts, chapter 2, day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls on 120 in the upper room. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. They all begin to speak in tongues. They come out of the upper room. They go into the streets. Big commotion. Crowds gather, and they're like, what in the world is going on? And then later, they're back into a place of prayer. The building is shaken. They're refilled again with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, it doesn't take a rocket science to see that there's a misconnect. There's a lack of congruence between what they do and what we do. Because we don't speak the word with boldness. As a matter of fact, most of us are very timid about sharing our faith. We're very timid about preaching. We're very timid about talking about Jesus and the resurrection. And they weren't. 
They weren't. And that's why they saw some of the explosive growth that they saw, because they were going to do this with boldness. And I think one of the reasons is because they understood that it's truth. It's not a myth. It's not just a religion, a crutch, or anything like that. It is the very central truth of everything that God is doing in humanity. And so they were unashamed to say, hey, guess what? Jesus has risen. He's made a big difference in my life, make a big difference in your life, but you've got to believe. And, and, they, and they forced that. So we go back to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, then those who had received the word were baptized, and that day there was added about 3,000 souls. And so they're receiving the word. They're receiving this message. They're putting faith into it and credence into it. But also, it was the word of the resurrection of Christ. Now, this is the day of Pentecost. This is the outpouring of the Spirit. And if you remember, they come out and they're like, what's going on? What is this madness? And Peter stands up and Peter goes back into the book of Joel, right? And he takes these scriptures about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He goes into some of the writings of David and he pulls out this stuff about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then he talks about this baptism in the Holy Spirit is the promise and the fulfillment of the Father, which comes to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus sacrificed his life, rose, ascended, and now that he's ascended, he's pouring out this thing that was promised all the way back through the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic covenant and all the Old Testament. This isn't something that should be catching you guys by surprise. And they're like, oh. And so they believe and they're baptized about 3,000. Explosive, explosive growth. We go back in Acts chapter 4, verse 1. They were speaking to the people and the priests and the captains of the temple guard, and the Sadducees came to them, being greatly disturbed because they're teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And so they're teaching. They're teaching. They're like, guys, this isn't something foreign to us. This is our heritage as Jews. We're looking for Messiah. Messiah came. We were looking for a political Messiah, a military Messiah, a tactician. Jesus came with an entirely different kingdom that's so much more better because it's in our hearts and it's eternal and it's love and it's peace and it's joy. And so they're teaching all this, really, and look, what it's, look who they're teaching to. The priests, the temple guards, and the Sadducees. The very one who crucified Jesus in the beginning goes on it says and they laid their hands on them and put them in jail until the next day for it was already evening in other words like they're they're rushing into the lion's den they're not going to their neighbor bill across the street they're going right to the guys that crucified jesus and they hey we got a message for you and and, and they're they're like all about it and then it says many of those who had heard the message believed even a number of men came to be about five thousand five thousand they're pushing the envelope and they're seeing results. Do you know why? Because Paul said it's through the foolishness of preaching whereby men are saved. It does not come by osmosis. It does not come by angels because they cannot preach the gospel. That is something that is solely given to the responsibility of people. It's our responsibility to preach. And guess what? When we put the word of God in its proper place and are bold about it, do you know what happens? People get saved. It's as simple as that. It's not rocket science. People get saved. 5,000 get saved. Acts chapter 6. So the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples, and they said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So now they're like, hey, we got people with needs in our community. And Jesus told us that we should be loving, we should be supportive, we should be giving. And so we're going to start a food pantry, and we're going to start a clothing drive, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and Peter and the apostles, and they're like, hey, wait a minute. That's awesome. That's awesome. You guys ought to do that, but not us. We need to give attention to the Word of God, because this is what is the genesis of everything that's taking place in the kingdom of God. We're not going to neglect the word of God. This is their attitude towards it. We're not going to neglect this. This is, this is, this is the power of God. And, uh, and it says, but we will devote ourselves, um, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so there it is again, like that. Listen, we're going we're gonna to push in, we're going to push into the word of God. Um, then it goes on, it says, the statement <clears throat> found favor in the eyes uh, of the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, uh, uh, Nicanor, Timian, uh, Perineus, and Nicholas. 
that moving background is messing me up because I lost my place in my scriptures, and so I'm looking. Um, so, so, they, so they get these other people that are going to do that for them so that they can keep doing what they do. And then it goes on and it says, and these they brought before the apostles after praying over them. They laid their hands on them. The word of God kept spreading and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests are becoming obedient to the faith. So they're like, listen, we're not going to neglect the word because that's where results comes from. And so they set these other people up to take care of the, meeting the needs of the people. They keep preaching the word. They keep teaching. Everyone's, and even the priests now are getting saved. You know why? Because they knew there was no body. If anyone was going to produce a body, it was going to be the priests, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. And they can't. And they're like, these guys are doing the same stuff Jesus did. This, is, this, is, this has got to be true. This, and so they're now starting to become obedient to the word as they're spreading the word around. Acts chapter um, five, uh, 8, verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began what? Proclaiming Christ to them. He didn't go down with a cool philosophy. He didn't go down and say, hey, I'm going to start a church. He went down preaching Jesus. That's what he's doing. That's our job. He's preaching. He's proclaiming Christ to them. Later on, signs and wonders take place. Later on, miracles, but he's teaching them. Go to 814. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received what? The word of God, they sent Peter and John. So Samaria, they're having signs and wonders and miracles and there's great joy in the city and then they start receiving, then they send Peter and John so they start receiving the Spirit of God. To be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Speaking in other tongues. And this thing is self-perpetuating. This thing is self-energizing. You see, there's no church growth without first being word growth. It just doesn't happen. But when, that, when that's happening, you can't stop it. You just simply can't stop it. Um, my son lives in Tahoe, California. He sends Darlene and I pictures. Uh, the air quality over there is absolutely horrible. The pictures, everything is like a, a, a yellowish haze. He's constantly coughing and hacking up because uh, there's forest fire. California is burning down. There's like 25, 26 uncontrollable forest fires right now in the state of California. One just north of them is 30 miles wide. He told me the other day, he said, Dad, we have 5% humidity. That's like dry as dry can be. He says we have hundreds of years of forest mismanagement. We have these storms, these big lightning storms that don't give us any rain, but just lightning strikes, and then we got 40 mile an hour winds. You can't stop that kind of stuff. They're doing the best they can, they just can't stop it. That's what happens with the wind of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the preaching of the Word of God. It takes off and nobody can stop it. And this becomes a predicament to some people in the book of Acts as we go on. In Acts chapter 8, verse 25, when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back in Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. This is all through the book of Acts. This is why this is one of the main keys. What is the dynamic? What is the distinction? They're all about the word of God. And Jesus demonstrated this because before Jesus did a lot of Jesus stuff, he taught and preached the kingdom. He sowed the word of God first, and then the Spirit confirmed the word with signs and wonderings. That's what the Bible says. Paul said, I fully preached the gospel everywhere I went with the Spirit confirming with signs and wonders and the demonstration and power of the Spirit. So look at Jesus at work. Jesus was going through all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. He wasn't just going around like, you know, healing everybody. He was teaching and preaching. That was that was, um, that was the, the primary meaning. That was the centristic meaning. Everything else was secondary to support the preaching of the Word of God. Why is that so important? Paul says in Romans 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Talking to a woman uh, uh, just this past week, as a matter of fact, she says, well, I'm really praying for faith. And I looked at her and I said, that's not how it comes. And she was like, all put out. Like, what do you mean? I thought, you know, God gives us anything we ask for. Well, no, because God already told us how faith comes. This is the only scripture in the Bible that tells us where faith comes from. It comes from hearing the word of God, not prayer. So if you want more faith, you can pray for it until the cows come home. God's saying, stop praying and get into the scriptures because that's where faith is going to come from. And apply it to your life and watch what happens to your faith. Live it out and watch what begins to happen to your faith because faith comes by hearing, hearing 
by the word of Christ. God says through Jeremiah the prophet, then says the Lord, you've seen well, for I watch over my word to perform it. God watches over his, the Bible says the eyes of God go to and fro over the whole earth, seeking those whose hearts are towards him, that he might show himself strong in their lives. Smith Wigglesworth used to say, God will go over a million people to get to the one that's saying, here I am in faith. I'm standing on the scriptures. Why? Because he's watching over. He's not backing politics. He's not backing world economics. He's not backing Hollywood. He's not backing philosophies and isms. He's backing his word. He watches over his word to perform it. Isaiah 55, 11, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing that which I desire and without succeeding in the matter which I sent it. And he sends his word to cover every single need of humanity. You need courage? Find the scriptures that talk about courage. You need to defeat, you need to defeat you know, depression and discouragement? Find the scriptures that come against that. Because he's going to send the scripture and he's going to back it. It's not going to return to him void when you stand on that. Um, But, but, you know, here again, we have to be serious, like he's serious, about his word. The writer of Hebrews said this, The word of God is living, active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as under the division of soul and spirit, both joints and marrow, and is able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. So he's talking about both the word and Jesus, because Jesus is the word, and this is a logos in the Greek a, way, a form of communication, in other words, thoughts that have been captured by paper and ink, but those thoughts are the thoughts of God. Paul said we have the mind of Christ. When we're in the scriptures, we kind of know what God wants of us. We, we get that, we understand that. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, listen, the word is powerful. We don't read the word, the word reads us. We read the scriptures and we're like, wow, we get convicted sometimes. We get like, wow, i got to get my act together in this thing sometimes. i got to apply this to my life sometimes. But we we get into the Scriptures. The Scripture reads us. It it, it ministers to us, and it gets us going. We get that. That's why all of these discovery Bible studies, because there's active discovery that's happening right there in the moment of what God is speaking to me through the Scriptures. It happens right then and there in the moment. He's communicating to us. There's a lot of people, oh, well, I, I I get close to God in nature. Hey, granted, but even the Bible says we see his divine attributes and his glory in nature. We see his creative genius. You know, we see all that displayed in nature. But what else do we see in nature? We see a reflection of the fall, right? Because we see the bear eat the deer. And we see the wolves take down the moose. And we see the pastor shoot the squirrels. I mean, we see all this kind of stuff in nature that tells us, you know, well, hey, it's glorious, but it ain't 100% right. But when we come here, we get a full revelation of God and the highest revelation of God, who is the person of Jesus Christ. We see God in the flesh telling us everything that we need to know. So it's so important. 2 Peter 3, 5. When they maintain this, they escape, they escape their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, the earth was formed out of water and by water. So we understand that God, remember last week we looked at the fact that God can call that which does not exist into being call he speaks jesus at the tomb lazarus come forth he called into being what was not and gave life to the dead only god can do that only god can do that no other world religion no other philosophy can do that and so we understand that that the world was created by the word of god god spoke and it was into being and it was there and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So we know God through the Word. We know God through Jesus. We know Jesus through the Word. This is all a thing, but it's all the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. The Word became flesh and revealed these things to us. And then James says this, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. There's nothing else that can save the human soul other than the sacrifice of Christ and the proof of its validity by his resurrection and then believing that. 
but you've got to receive it, right? We have to receive what we're hearing. And I love when you get into the Greek and you start pulling all these words apart, the word filthiness there literally means earwax. In other words, basically saying, unstop your ear so you can hear the word of God because it is what transforms your soul. It is what brings transformation, but you've got to be able to hear it. That's why Jesus always said to those who have ears to hear. Well, they all had these things. Everybody back in the you know, New Testament times were earless. So what's he saying when he says those who have ears to hear? He's talking about opening your ears, receiving this, believing it, putting, you know, putting uh, your, your money where your mouth is, as it were. And so it's the word of God is still as powerful as in Genesis 1.1, where it says in the beginning God created everything. He created it through his word. He spoke. And it's spoken, and when we stand on what is spoken, he's watching over it to perform it, and he's not going to let it return to him void without accomplishing what it was sent to do. So when I stand, you know, if I'm battling depression, if I'm battling anxiety, if I'm battling fear, and I start standing on the scriptures and coming against that, guess what's going to happen? He's going to confirm that word. He's, it's not going to return to him void. It's going to be power. Things are going to start happening. When I receive the word of God <laughs> about healing, and I stand on God's will to heal, <laughs> then guess what? He's going, to, he's going to back that. When I hear the scriptures about salvation, I stand on it. There's no power in heaven or hell that can stop me from getting saved. Because it's God's word. They believe in their heart, they confess with their mouth, and they shall be saved. So all of these things are just talking about the power of the word of God. In the early church, they got this right. Even in the face of persecution, they got it right. Acts chapter 11 says, so then those who were scattered, now let me just stop right there. <clears throat> so Stephen is one of the disciples, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom. He's in Jerusalem. He's having it out with the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes, and they can't come against his wisdom. So when your heart becomes hardened to where you will not believe, the only thing left is anger. And so they stone him to death. And then they think, hey, that felt pretty good. Why stop there? Let him be the first domino. Let them all start coming down. So a persecution breaks out, and it says, so then who's scattering? Because, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to start killing Christians. This is fun. So they start scattering. Those who scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except the Jews. So they're scattering, but they're not stopping sharing the word of God. See, see the American church, we're not, we don't do this. We don't do this were too timid. They had boldness. We have timidity. And then we wonder why our nation is becoming communistic. We've created a void. Nature abhors a void. Something's going to fill that, that, that vacuum. Something's going to fill. And so all of a sudden, we've got socialists in our government. We've got communists going by the name of Antifa and BLM and all these other little organizations springing up all over the place that want to rip our Constitution apart, rip it down, and rewrite it into socialism. we got to preach the Word of God. Because I'll tell you right now, I personally, I believe it's too far gone for politics to heal it. I really do. This stuff is getting entrenched deeper and deeper and deeper in our society. Right now. Got a nurse in the church, got my own daughter. The mandate's coming down. Get the vaccine or get out. Whatever happened to keep your laws off my body? Remember that from the liberals and the, the Democrats and the abortion crowd? Keep your laws off my body. Now it's like, you don't like it, you lose your job. And it's spreading outside of just the medical and to law enforcement and even stores and traveling, all this stuff. Show me your papers. When have we ever heard that before, right? You can't go in, show me your papers. Whatever happened to live free or die? Man, we've got to speak the word. So it goes on and it says in verse 20, but there were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. What are they doing? They're, they're not preaching the Bible. Hey, do you know it's Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you know, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus? No, they're preaching Jesus. They're preaching Jesus. And it says, and the word of the Lord was with them and a large number also believed. So these guys, these, these first crew, the Jews, they scatter and they're only preaching to Jews. 
And then all of a sudden, these other guys come up from these other towns, and they're like, hey, you know what? I'll bet you God might love everybody. And let's try it out on the Greeks and the Romans and these other people. Not the French. Ooh, but, you know, I'm just kidding. So I'm French. Come on. I'm poking fun at myself, right? So, so they start preaching, and guess what happens? People start getting saved. I love it in the book of Acts. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The crowd gathered, and they were hearing them speak in their own language. Sometime we've got to speak the language of the people we're trying to reach. I mean, we're all called to witness to everybody, but sometimes somebody who's just like really in the goth culture, I better receive by the golf, cup, golf, you know, the goth culture. I mean, you know, they're all in the black and the black lipstick and the tats and everything, and whoa, open door, easy to receive. Bikers, like I'm not going to go witness the hell's angels, you know, I mean, unless I hear the audible voice of God. I'm not all tatted up and all this, you know, you know I'm a biker, I own a bike, but you know what I'm saying? So I'm saying sometimes it's easier. LGBT, Go on YouTube and look at the testimonies of LGBT people coming out of the lifestyle, gay, lesbian, transgender, transsexual, you name it, getting saved, getting delivered by the power of Christ, and have a powerful message to their community that Jesus saves and Jesus transforms lives. It's phenomenal. So, so we, need to, we, need to, we need to live this out. We need to live this out. And then it goes on in verse 19. It says, And many who practiced the magic brought their books together, began burning them in the sight of everyone, and they counted up the price of them and found them to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So what's happening here in context? Paul goes to Ephesus, a Greek city. In Ephesus, he preaches the gospel. Now, they're doing their hocus pocus stuff with their magic. You know, they're... they're Reiki healing here and something there and, you know, uh, Eastern meditation here and they're doing all their hocus pocus stuff. And Paul comes in and he goes, hey, this is the power of God. Be healed, be healed, be delivered, be raised from the dead. And, And they're all like, holy smokes, we can't hold a candle to that. And they end up getting saved because Paul's proclaiming, God is confirming, there's no argument. There's no argument. I believe with all of my heart, younger generation in America today will not come to Christ until they hear that two together. The word preached and signs and wonders confirming it. Right? But when they come, they're going to come strong. They're going to come solid. And so, so they're getting saved. And not only they're getting saved, but they're repenting. It's not enough to receive Jesus. You've got to receive Jesus and push out the other stuff. So they're denouncing they're magic. They're bringing their books in. Now, I've, I've read up a lot about you know, the Bible, obviously. and so, so a lot of theologians say that some of these books that they were burning actually went all the way back to the ancient magic arts of Egypt. And you remember in Egypt when Moses went and threw his staff down and became a serpent? And they did the same? That's creepy. And then Moses' snake ate all their snakes? That's awesome. Then Moses turns the water to blood. They turn the water to blood. And then the flies, and then they do the flies, and then they get to the lice. Now, in Egypt, they believed in body cleansing. They shaved their entire body, men and women, and if they wore a wig, they wore a wig, but they shaved everything, and they were all about bathing and all about hygiene and cleanliness. When the lice came, that was the end of the story. They didn't want to replicate that one. And from that point on was a tipping scale, and the signs at Moses were just worse and worse and worse. But they were doing a pretty good job. These are the books that they're burning. 50,000 pieces of silver, they're saying like, that would be like $10 million today. They're, burning, they're bringing these artifacts of their dark religions and their paganism and all of this stuff. They're burning it. They're burning it before God. And they're saying, this is a sign of a new life. I'm denouncing this whole stuff. Man, that's transformation probably some horoscope books in there let's be real now ouch just saying right a couple of ouija boards in there (gasps) skulls and owls and all these you know just saying and they burn them and then it says what after that the word of the lord was growing mightily and prevailing because you can't stop it you can't stop it now the weapon the best part the weapon paul says this take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of god this is also a weapon we have weapons 
to defeat enemies. We have weapons to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. Dear Lord, the more we defund the police department, the more everybody should be carrying a heater. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like the world is now superly becoming a scary place. I'm watching videotapes on the news of blatant, right on the street in broad daylight, people being shot in the back of the head, people being, you know, beaten and, and stabbed. and all. It's like insane. Like how, where do, how do people come up with the conclusion that removing the defense against criminals is going to make criminals stop being criminals? I mean, like, how does that even happen in the real world, right? I love it. I, I, I've got my eyes on Minneapolis. That's going to be the best show in town. Because Soros is bankrolling the whole thing to not defund the police department, but to completely do away with it. And they're going to introduce social workers. So the next guy high on heroin that's crazed out of his brain with a great big machete walking on the street, a, a social worker is going to go, excuse me, sir. I understand you're having a bad day. <laughs> so we have weapons, right? Weapons for self-defense. Guess what? God gives us weapons for self-preservation, for self-defense in the, in, the, in the fight that we're in, in the conflict that we're in. Because you're in a conflict. You are in a battle. He gives us these weapons. And look at how he demonstrates the use of them. The tempter came to him and said, and I love this because I just see this pointy-faced little pin-nosed peeny. You just want to backhand him into the yesterday, you know. But he comes, if you're the son of God, command these stones that they might be bred. And he answered and said, it is written. It is written. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, I love this because if, if Satan would have come to Jesus and said, if you this any good, and Jesus would have said, I am the son of God, depart from me, you created angel, idiot, jerk, pinhead. <laughs> okay, that was my own narrative, but, right? That would have worked for Jesus, but it wouldn't have done any good for us, because we're not God. So Jesus, who's 100% flesh, says, hey guys, watch this, I'm going to show you how it's done. I'm 100% God, but I'm going to not use that. I'm going to just stay in the flesh, and I'm going to show you how it's done in the flesh. Satan, it is written. Three times. Hey, if you're the Son of God, turn the bread into stones. Satan, it is written. If you're the Son of God, bow down and worship me. Satan is written. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself off the pinnacle. Satan, it is written. And then it says, and he left. It's like, okay, I've had enough of that. No, no one you're getting beat up, right? You know, no one, it's over. So he leaves. So Jesus is showing us. But notice it said, he said. He didn't think. He didn't call the pastor. He didn't go to the psychoanalyst. He didn't go to the therapist. He said something. Go to Matthew chapter 11, and it says, Seeing at a distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of figs. And he said to it. I don't know about you, but if I see somebody talking to a tree, cray cray. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, I mean, and I know there's some people that do that because they have feelings. But Jesus comes to this tree and he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So they're on their way into Jerusalem. They're staying in Bethany. This little episode happens. They go into Jerusalem. They come back into Bethany. The next day, they're heading back out again. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look at the fig tree that you cursed. Now, he didn't do some hocus-pocus shazam alakabam. He just spoke negative words to it. And Peter's saying, you cursed it, and it died from its very roots. We can curse people with our mouths. When we speak critically and negative and harsh and judgmental to children, we are cursing them. We are breaking down their spirits. We crush them. Now, I'm not saying we don't discipline. I'm just saying when we're always, you'll never amount to anything. You're so stupid. You're like your mother or you're like your father or you're like your uncle. It doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a curse. 
When we speak negatively about or to our spouse, we're cursing them. We're using something that God is life and death and the power of the tongue. And we're using that in a wrong way. Jesus spoke negatively to a fig tree. It died. It was cursed. We have the power under the covenant of Abraham to be a blessing to the nations of the world. Not a curse. Because we're speaking the gospel. We're speaking the word. We're speaking the resurrection of Jesus. It's a curse. And so they're like, Jesus, dude, look what happened to the tree. It's gone. Like it's dying. It's withering up and dying. Jesus said, truly I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain. Now he's talking to mountains. Trees, mountains. Whoever says to this mountain, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, does not doubt in his heart, but believes in what he says is going to happen, it will be granted. Jesus is talking about talking, speaking to your problems, to your issues, to your lack of a job, to your marriage is crumbling, to your anger, to your depression, to your overeating, to your addictions. He's, taking, he's saying, speak to those things. Because a lot of times there are entities behind those things. We see a mountain, and we say, oh, I've got a mountain of an addiction, and I can never be free. And behind that mountain is probably something. And Jesus is saying, speak to that. Take authority. Jesus talked about binding. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Then he talked about loosing. Whatever is loose on earth is loose in heaven. So bind some things. I bind you in Jesus' name. What if it doesn't work? Then try loosing. But whatever, speak. Speak to it. Speak to your depression. I wake up and I feel blue. Speak to it. Say, I will not have you in my life. I rebuke you. I curse you. I put my foot down. I will not give you an opportunity in my life. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I have joy as a fruit of the Spirit, and I'm living by Jehovah. Shalom, my peace, and he gives me joy. And start speaking that claim what's yours. Use the weapon. This is why so many Christians are living weak, defeated lives, because they're not standing on what God's given us. Every aspect, every area of your life. I got the pink slip. There's a big mountain in my life. I need another job. Speak to the mountain. God will give you another job. I'm getting evicted. I'm going to lose my, my, my house or my mobile home or my apartment or whatever it is, and there's nothing else out there right now. Does that matter to the God who's limitless? Speak to the mountain. God will provide for you. Fight that fight. Stand in that place of speaking to the mountain. And then we see this demonstrated in the life of David. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of the hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Now just imagine, you're a 14, 15-year-old kid You love God. And all of a sudden, there's a nine-foot weapon of mass destruction. Helmet, shield, breastplate, greaves on his shoulders, on everywhere. She, a, a sword, a, a, a javelin. He's a, he's a champion. He doesn't lose. He's a stinking giant. Can whack you away with one hand. And here's David, and he says, I can take him. I can take him. And here's the reason why. is because he looked through Goliath and saw God. And he says, Goliath is big, but God is bigger. God is bigger. And Goliath, you think you're something? You're coming to me with all of this weapon and all this intimidating armor? I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. And look at now he starts saying some things. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down and I will remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the armies of the Philistines this day to the birds uh, of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, all that the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. He's looking past the mountain. He's speaking to the mountain because he's looking. If you look, if you start, if you look at the mountain and speak to the mountain, the mountain's going to intimidate you. If you look at the giant and speak to the giant, the giant's going to intimidate you. But if you look through those problems, which represent any problem that you have in life, 
addictions, depression, whatever. God is bigger. God is bigger. And I'm going to start saying some things that God can do. It is not by might nor power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm an overcomer through Christ who loves me. He's caused me to be the head. You come against me one way, you'll flee seven. He's caused me to more than triumph. And all, you know, all of a sudden, perspective starts changing. And God shows up, and David whacks him in the head, and then David walks up, takes his sword, and lops his head off. And picks that big, gruely thing up. And I mean, that thing's dripping blood and guts all over him because victory is messy sometimes. Victory is like freedom. You know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta get into this. It's like, this is, if you want victory, you fight hard for it. And if it's worth having, then the celebration is sweet. When it's something that's life and death and you need something and you're desperate, man, when it happens, you hold that head up high. This is what God does to his enemies. You look through the giant, you look through the mountain, and you speak what God says in his word. It is a weapon, and it is the only weapon that we have. You've got to accept God's word, and you've got to rely on it. You've got to act on it, and you've got to live it, and you've got to obey it. So that means that, yeah, I'm going to speak to my Goliath. I'm going to speak to my mountain, yeah. But that means when God nudges me, and he said, um, hey, you need to forgive that person. You're either all in or you're not. So, okay, I'm all in into obedience of the word of God. All right, you know, Lord, it's not worth it. I definitely, I'll forgive them. I definitely forgive them. Absolutely. The Bible, um, you know, the Bible says to be kind. And so, uh, like, I, I'm, I'm usually like three or four, ser- you know, two or three or four sermons ahead of where I am today. So I got all this other stuff floating around in my head. That's why I'm psychotic, you know, because I'm just like, <laughs> and so, so like, like I, I started working on a, on a sermon about kindness. And then I like to practice what I preach, and plus I get illustrations and stuff, so I'm like, oh, I'm going to be kind. It's just a certain illustrations. like, I'm going to be kind to this person. And you ever have something, you do it, and it comes back and bites you big time? I'm like, I'm not going to be kind. People are jerks. <laughs> that, is like, that is just like the human default, right? It's like, the heck with you. I mean, that, that, that's ridiculous. And God says, hey, wait a minute. I didn't say it was going to be easy. I just told you to be kind. I didn't tell you to be kind only if their response is kindness in return. I just told you to be kind. But I want, no, I just told you to be kind. I'm like, well, this stinks. <laughs> do you want to preach a sermon or not? <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I do. So, so, so we got to obey. We've got to obey that scripture even when it's tough. We got, oh, man, we've got to control our thoughts. We've got to control our thoughts, and we've got to feed our faith. Faith comes by the word of God. The enemy is not under your bed. Remember when you're kids, you know, you're afraid of a monster under my bed. The enemy's not in the closet. The enemy is not that bump you hear at the end of the hallway. Pastor, come pray over my house. I think there's a devil in there. Yeah, you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love, I love it. Just kidding. You know, you know where the, he's not the, you know, your head's going to do three, you know where the enemy is? Thoughts. Thoughts. You want to know how he works? Thoughts. 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 Labels. We live in a society of labels. Nobody can just be a person anymore. Everybody, and it starts in school. They're ADHD. What kid isn't? Can I just ask that question? They're children, for God's sakes. What kid doesn't ping off the walls and go crazy for Cocoa Puffs? You know what I'm saying? So, so but no, oh, we're going to give them Ritalin, and we're going to start, bam, 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 bam. Let's drug them to where they don't know what they are or who they are, and then we're living under labels. Oh, panic disorder, label, depression, label, You're not smart enough. You never will be. You're slow. Somebody cursed you and put labels in your life. You'll never succeed. You're not enough. Labels, 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 thoughts, 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 and you got to stop it. And you put your foot down and you start rewiring the machine. Hey, wait a minute. I'm the apple of God's eye. If God is for me, who is against me? I don't care who labels me what. Listen, personally, I didn't care when they labeled me an idiotic, drug addict, drunk, 
that like was passed out half the time. You know, he's stupid. You know, look at he's wasting his life. I didn't care what you thought about me when I was all hooked up with Jim Beam. I certainly don't care what you think about me now that I'm all hooked up with Jesus Christ. Right? That's where it's at right there. And it's that decision. Yeah, go ahead, give the Lord a clap offering because that is where it's at. So it is, it is a weapon. So when we look at the book of Acts, and again, let's put this in perspective, because they transformed the entire Roman Empire, the entire Mediterranean European area. They transformed it. They started out at zero with 120, and 300 years later, it is the religion of the empire. It's now they're saying, you better be a Christian, which probably wasn't healthy either. How did that happen in 300 years? What, was, what were they doing? The Word. They were receiving and then communicating. Receiving, then instructing. Receiving, then teaching. The Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. The Word, if there's no Word, nothing's going to happen because it's the foundation of the kingdom. It's the foundation of the kingdom. And it's also your weapon. But boy, you've got to realize that it's a, it's a real thing. It's a real battle. You might even, right now, you might be thinking, I think he's psychotic. Maybe. Maybe I'm not in my right mind. But I'm not going back into my old mind for nothing. Because this one feels a lot better. There's peace, there's love, there's joy, there's patience, there's temperance, there's long suffering, there's self control. There's, there, this, is, this is good. This feels right. And I've seen it work. That when I stand up against the Goliaths that come against me, none of us are exempt. And when I stand against the mountains that come against me, I know how to fight, and I don't fight fair. I fight with the Word of God, and I fight to win. And when you have that mentality, you win. The battle is the Lord's, and He gives you the victory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the dynamic power that's in the Word of God. Help us, oh, help us, God, to please understand that it is foundational. It is, it's, it's literally everything on which your kingdom revolves around. And it is what created everything that we know, both seen and unseen. And so, Lord, help us to understand the place that it needs to play in our lives, that we can't play around with the Word. It's got to be... It's got to be central. It's got to be something that we do with boldness and that we live it and we make that decision that we're drawing a line in the sand and we're not going to go back. And we're going to see the power demonstrated in our lives and also in the lives of everyone we encounter as we stand on the Scriptures and not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. And we're thankful that you are such a good God and a loving God and a forgiving God and a merciful God. And we walk in that mercy. I ask that you bless each and every person here today in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Have a victorious week in Christ. Stand on the word.